Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that George W. Bush, Barbara Bush, and even their dog Millie were all diagnosed with autoimmune conditions during a 16 month period while living in the White House. They actually had Graves disease, which attacks the thyroid. That's kind of an interesting little thyroid tidbit. And it does raise the question is, can something in your environment trigger autoimmune things that might be related to your thyroid? Um, sneak preview, I think the answer is yes. Today's guest on the show might have something to do with thyroid, as you could have guessed, because I kind of made it easy for you. Today's guest is Jen Whitman. She's a certified holistic health expert and coach who looks at practical solutions for thyroid and autoimmune conditions. And if you're a Bulletproof fan, you've been listening for a while, you know that I've had all kinds of autoimmunity myself growing up weighing 300 pounds. I've reversed my Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition. So I don't have any antibodies to my own thyroid anymore, things like that. So it's interesting because you could be listening in your car right now going, Mm, thyroid, schmyroid, what do I care? Like I'm perfectly healthy. Well, actually you're probably not perfectly healthy. Few of us are perfectly healthy. There's rooms for improvement for just about all of us. But more importantly, if you have an autoimmune condition, you probably don't know it. And that's why this kind of podcast is important because if you hear things like, gee, I'm a little t more tired than I should be, other things like that, this gives you an awareness that says, pay attention because this might be worthy of exploration for me or someone that I care about, or maybe you're like rocking it and you have tons of energy and your thyroid's just fine. I think pretty much most people living in the West today can benefit from paying attention to autoimmunity and thyroid, which is why Jen is here. Jen's also written a book called Healing Hashimoto's Naturally, and she's written things like the Super Mom's Guide to Managing Thyroid Disease and has written a ton of other things about thyroid. She's the host of Thyroid Radio, and pretty much if it says thyroid in it, it's got her name on it somewhere. Is that accurate, Jen? <laughs> I wish I could take all the credit for that, but that's nice. <laughs> Is it true that you and Al Gore invented the thyroid gland? Yes, we did, we did, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, welcome to the show, and, and thanks for, for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a real honor, actually. Now, if, if you're listening in your car, you, you can just like ignore me for a second. But if you're watching this on YouTube or on the iTunes video channel, uh, you might have noticed that we've upgraded equipment quite a bit. You're getting HD video that's not just Skype. We're actually doing professional video editing with professional video cameras on these now. This is a huge amount of time and effort and not a small amount of money either in order to make this happen. But I, I feel like you get more value when you can see what I'm doing. You can see what Jen's doing. And so you can expect better video quality. So if this thing rocks in your car, go home and check it out online. You might see even more. And so Jen, thanks for being our guinea pig with the new cameras. All right. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> now you have an interesting background. Um, you've sort of had a tangle with a big truck, uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injury. What happened? Like, walk me through that story. Yeah, it really starts with kind of like a thousand little things that you don't even realize you're doing that kind of ended with this big semi truck accident. But basically, what happened was I was, you know, a kid of the 70s and of the convenience food age and a latchkey kid. And so I ate a lot of foods that weren't very nourishing or weren't even really food because, you know, everything was coming out with dim tea, more beef stew, and, and those, um, those frozen dinners that you stick in oh. the microwave with plastic on them. I used to eat those too. Yeah. And they were delicious <laughs> and they were filled with sodium and all kinds of chemicals and stuff. So I, and, and Twinkies and things like that made up the majority of my diet. So, you know, I went into my twenties, not really noticing that, um, these symptoms were popping up cause I just thought it was kind of part of being in your twenties, like having fun and partying yeah. and all that stuff. I thought, well, you know, yeah, I'm tired because I was out all night or I can't sleep because I've had, you know, so much caffeine or this or that. So I, you know, I was eating poorly and then a semi truck comes and hits us. It hits my, my husband and well, I in While car. you were eating poorly. While I was eating, exactly like, like, at the like same Like Taco moment. Bell on your face kind of thing? <laughs> There, there have been days, but um, no, not exactly <laughs> then. I was actually holding a cup of peach tea, but, um, 
you know, in my life, basically these things I wasn't noticing were starting to add up. And then what happened was we were hit by the semi truck and that kind of changed the trajectory of my entire life because all those little symptoms that I had really um, came to the forefront. And so from the accident, there was the PTSD and also um, you know, pretty severe uh, body injury on my right side, which ca which had me disabled for a period of time. How long and were you? How long did that disable you? About six months. Wow. And then I had to work out of it. Um, from, I was a chef, I, I guess I should have mentioned, I was a chef before that, so I had learned how to make food, you know, from whole food ingredients, but I wasn't actually eating that way because that's not how I was really trained to eat. And, you know, being a chef and always being on the go, you know, you're eating the worst thing. You're eating like the slop the leftover from the kitchen or, you know, whatever you find in your house on your way to working an 80 hour, 100 hour work week. So, you know, all of that stuff with the disability was like, I basically couldn't be a chef anymore. And I had to work my way into even being able to like stand for a certain period of time every day or being able to sit for too long. So my, the, that injury really affected me, both my hip with standing and sitting. So all of that though, brought to the forefront, sort of the, the insomnia I was having and just, um, how I didn't feel great in my body. So flash forward a couple years, I'm feeling better, but I have a baby <laughs> and that like hormonal, you know, swing kicked me into Hashimoto's and it was all due to kind of the stress around the accident, the stress around the lawsuit that ensued after the accident and then having this baby. So it's kind of a really convoluted long story, but it was all these little things that added up to an autoimmune disease. So, so you think it was basically physical stress and environmental stress that triggered the autoimmunity? And emotional stress, okay. all of it, yeah, from definitely the physical stress, the brain injury I had, um, now, you know, the research is coming out that brain injuries, you know, connect straight to your gut. And I believe that was the beginning of the leaky gut. And that may have been the beginning of that whole kind of multi-system breakdown between your thyroid and your adrenals and your gut. And that is just like perfect soup for Hashimoto's. So, do you mind if I ask you a little more about, about PTSD? Like I've had PTSD, yeah. I've hacked it. I don't have it anymore, but like, are you comfortable talking about it? Oh, totally. All yeah. right. So there are a sizable number of people who think PTSD is like made up fairy dust and it doesn't right. exist. Tell me exactly what PTSD was like for you. Wow. So in the beginning, it was just reliving over and over and over again, the accident to the point of where like I was constantly like, <gasps> You know, like I couldn't even, I couldn't function because I was just having this memory triggered over and over and over again that was putting me in panic mode. And then what happens um, a lot of time with P PTSD is that you get this kind of thick brain fog. And so I just couldn't focus anymore, think clearly, and I became overwhelmed so easily. So here I was a chef prior to this accident, a chef working, you know, my last job before the accident, I was working 115 hours a week. Okay. That's an insane wow. amount of work. I was able to stand and focus and I was actually the boss. So I had to organize a lot of different people and staff. And then now after the accident, I can't handle the tiniest bit of stress completely overwhelmed me. This PTSD, it kept me out of the car. You know, I was afraid to drive. I was basically Miss Daisy for five years and had every one of my friends and my husband just drive me around everywhere because I, so, I mean, PTSD is real. It just affects you on so many different levels. And then, you know, obviously it affected me physically as I think it was kind of the trigger to the autoimmune disease. So the, there's some, some interesting theories out there and PTSD in, in my, in my understanding, my sort of visceral understanding of it, like, like your body identifies something as a a threat to your existence. It, it's mm -hmm. something that it thinks will kill you. And anything that might remind you of that makes you feel like you're about to die. Like literally the same as if, you know, there was, you know, a tiger in midair, like your body right. sees something that's not a tiger as a tiger. And, and then you experience the physical things you should experience when there's a tiger about to land on you, which is like, I'm going to die. I have to curl up into ball. I have to get away. And it's a survival thing. Mm -hmm. And we know what happens when you're in survival mode. Your body's like, I don't care about digesting. Like, are you kidding me? I care about running away right now. And you know, you can throw up if you want to, I don't care, but, but this food isn't going anywhere because you're moving. 
And, and so like all the, the inner stuff shuts down and your parasympathetic nervous system, the part of you that's, you know, the relax and recover and absorb food part of you never gets to do its thing for very, very much time because the get ready to run part is just over engaged. And I pretty much had that for 30 years uh, because I was born like with the, the cord wrapped around my neck, which funny enough, triggers PTSD. <laughs> so well, funny, everything might be choking you. So your body's just always ready to fight. And right. maybe that was related to some of the autoimmunity that I've experienced. I have no idea. Um, but it, it's a very interesting thing because I, I think at this point, given what we've seen in, uh, in war veterans returning, that PTSD is now considered a real thing and, and it's, it's like an honorable thing to have versus five years ago, 10 years ago, it was like, you know, obviously you're a total wuss, like you should just man up and, and like you don't man up when a tiger is about to land on you. you it's <laughs> just not how it works, right? No, and there was a lot of, I, I have a background in psychology and so there was this period of time where that was sort of like an eye rolling diagnosis, yeah. like, oh yeah, he's got PTSD, you know? So it is good that it has, um, because it is so real that, that it now is more accepted as a real diagnosis. So you dealt with that somehow, and I want to understand how you got rid of your PTSD because we, we've had veterans, I have veterans working on the Bulletproof team who've had PTSD and used different ways to get around it. And also, I want to understand how you then connected that to your autoimmunity and then share like what, what could other people do to know if they have small bits of PTSD affecting their behavior in a way they don't know or what they could do to, to figure out their autoimmunity. So, so let's start with the PTSD. How did you unwrap that? Yeah, well, first um, I started with my diet because that was just something I was doing anyway because I didn't realize um, at the time how all of it was connected, but I knew that the way I was eating probably wasn't the best. So I started with my diet and realized that some of that brain fog from the PTSD lessened a little bit. Um, it didn't go away at the time because the PTSD was so strong. Uh, but then what I did is I started um, seeking out energy healers. So Reiki, cranial sacral workers, people to help with my nervous system. I did a lot of acupuncture at that time and it really helped calm my nervous system down. And that was allowing me to be, you know, relaxed when we would be driving and then there's a semi truck right next to us. Us, and I was just sure it was going to hit us, you know, it allowed me to be relaxed in that kind of situation. And um, the cranial sacral therapy really seemed to relieve tension that was just like almost physical tension around my brain, which that's how I felt after the accident is that there was constant physical tension here, but nothing was showing up. Um, in the uh, in the testing because actually the, te the the doctors refused to test for the first year after my accident and I kept saying there's something wrong with my brain I can't play piano I can't type well right now like there's a, something going on here they're like oh that's stress from the accident don't worry about it I, and I kept saying I need to get tested and finally after a year after that they did testing well apparently your brain will heal well which is a good thing um, and so it won't show the damage necessarily a year after, but then on tests, it did show that there was quite a bit of damage that had happened. So going, you know, doing the cranial sacral therapy to kind of just relieve that tension in my head. And then the Reiki really, really helped to, um, and, pl and that plus the diet really helped to move that PTSD away. So what's the relationship between PTSD and food? Well, I think anything that affects the gut, and now they know that um, mild traumatic brain injuries, which often lead to PTSD, um, will affect what's going on in your gut. And so it will create those gaps. You know, as we talk about leaky gut, is something commonly spoken about now. You know, it creates a leaky gut. And so food, you know, if you, if you don't know you have a leaky gut and then you're just throwing in every protein that is going to seep through that, you know, into the bloodstream and it, it will start to mount an autoimmune attack, um, then you're just really exacerbating the condition because food triggers all of that. So that's really the connection between, you know, PTSD, the stress of it. So let me back up for a second. The thyroid 
your adrenal your adrenal system and your gut are just intricately linked the, you, there's not really one problem it's always it's kind of three problems so when you find out that you have a thyroid imbalance you really have to address all three addressing one's not going to cut it so if you're just looking at your diet but you're not doing things to mitigate the stress you're going to still find that you have a thyroid condition or if you just try to mitigate the stress and you don't do the diet you're going to find that too. And then some people who need thyroid hormones, if they're not getting supplemented or, or any medicine, you know, correctly, then they're, then that's also going to continue the cycle. So they're all connected, but I forget what the original question was. <laughs> A little bit of that, that mild, mild brain fog. No, yeah, it'll come up. The, the, the <laughs> question was, uh, what happens between PTSD and food? Okay. And, and no, you, you answered it really well. And one of the things that, that I noticed, and one of the things that's actually built into the Bulletproof Diet is that if you eat a food that you're sensitive to, your heart rate goes up by 16 beats per minute within 90 minutes of your meal. And that's why there's that free app called Food Detective that's part of the diet. By the way, you can download it if you know you haven't already and you're listening to this. It's called Food Detective on the iPhone store. Yes, if you have an Android, you're basically a second class citizen. We don't have an Android app. We're still working on it. It'll probably come out whenever it's ready, but well, that's just life and I apologize. And you know, you could always get a real phone. Um, darn, did I say that out loud? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not an iPhone bigot, but um, here's the deal. 60 piece per minute. If you're already on the edge of fight or flight mode and you eat something that triggers your body that trigger that bumps up your heart rate like that can be enough to help with PTSD. And that's not the only reason. I think all the things you said are there, but that one thing like, wow, okay, now all of a sudden I was right on the edge of feeling ampy, but now I'm really feeling ampy and you have no idea it's because you ate gluten or because nightshade vegetables trigger you or whatever the thing is, you've got to find your own kryptonite, but your, your level of kryptonite, your tolerance for it will be lower if you have PTSD or if you have traumatic brain injury. So you worked with craniosacral therapy, which is another mm -hmm. thing that is even amongst the chiropractic uh, profession is oftentimes looked down upon. Like there are still chiropractic schools who will tell you that you cannot move the plates in the head, that they're completely fixed and locked in stone. Yet there are other people uh, who I've worked with as, who say, uh, no, you can do it. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe me here, move your own. And then they show you how to move them. And uh, I used to have this weird twitch on one side of my face. And literally the guy was like, okay, grab your head and just like tweak it. And I did. And funny enough, I could make that thing go away and you can actually feel the, the things shift in there. So yeah, even on x-rays, you can see that the bones in your head can move a little bit, but as a therapy, it's still maybe less accepted than PTSD. It, however it works for you. Yeah, well, and I think it's a lot of times it's because it's hard to describe. You know, I when I when I would tell my friends what this cranial sacral was, I was like, it's magic. That's all I know. I walked into the office, my hip was in fact cranial sacral therapy was the first thing that actually fixed my hip physically. So my hip and my legs were like this after the accident. I don't know if I can put that in the camera. Yeah. And then after one session, so after five years of pain and one session of cranial sacral therapy, my legs went back into alignment. And how do you describe that, that to somebody? When you say somebody is lightly touching your head or lightly touching your body, and then all of a sudden everything in your body falls back into alignment, it's really hard to describe to somebody. And I think that's a lot of times why these things get disregarded, that the, you know this is just not a real thing because it's just voodoo or magic. You get stuck in this, uh, this argument, and a lot of people have this, where it, it comes down to, that didn't happen because it can't happen, right. which is entirely unscientific because right. <laughs> if it did happen, the scientist without, uh, without a, a, a set dogmatic point of view would be like, that shouldn't have happened. I really want to understand why and see if it's repeatable. And if it appears that it is repeatable and if it sticks, therefore it probably wasn't placebo, then maybe a core assumption about the way things work was wrong. And if your core assumption is that when someone touches your head or someone does something, it can't work, but it does, you have to then adjust your worldview. And that adjustment for the worldview can trigger PTSD, which is why you see these online <laughs> huge, like crazy arguments where people are screaming about something as simple as, you know, what you should eat 
to be optimal or what kind of exercise is right. And it, it, it's really funny, but it comes down to these visceral things because it's questioning a worldview. And if less exercise works better than a lot of exercise and you've been doing a lot, oh my God, you were wrong. So I, I'm happy you mentioned craniosacral. I, I, I've seen it work. It doesn't always work, but should we throw it out as being absolute quackery? No, <laughs> absolutely. Like that would be ridiculous because of what you just said. Like after five years of trying everything, this one thing worked for me. Uh, and that alone is a very valuable data point. You and like, I have no idea how many other hundreds of thousands of people who've used it over the years. Well, and I'm a big skeptic. I'm, I'm a scientist at heart and you know, to the proof has to be in the pudding for me. So I went in there not expecting anything to work. It was just like the last thing that needed to happen. So I tried it and then it worked and then I was sold. But I, I mean, I feel that energy medicine is the future of medicine and that once we really start, you know, researching our energetic bodies and how that works, there's going to be a lot more healing to come. Uh, there, there is. And this whole idea of energy medicine, it's not even well defined for people, but right. I, we know, for instance, the stuff about heart rate variability, which I've, I've been talking about for a long time. I'm a certified uh, trainer in, in the heart math methodology. But you can measure what your heart does electromagnetically five feet out from your body. And we know that what mine do, my heart is doing, yours will pick up and vice versa. And our fields sort of start to match. And this isn't like woo-woo stuff. This is physics, very, very... Uh, delicate physics detectors that can detect subtle changes in magnetic fields that we couldn't do 50 years ago. But now we can measure them, we can see them. Wow, that just is, it's all kinds of new science, but it does provide a logical basis for saying we shouldn't ignore energy medicine. Uh, we also probably all don't want to just say everything is, is energy, so all you have to do is just want it and it happens because right. that doesn't match my reality. But if you don't want it, it's probably not going to happen. Also matches my reality. So, right. <laughs> You're doing some other cool stuff around around autoimmunity and something that I thought was pretty exciting I wanted to ask you about was you're working with Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein on a new documentary. Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, so actually I'm not working on their documentary. I was working with them as a health coach. Oh, as a health coach, okay. And, and they invited me, um, gosh, it was back in 2013. They invited me to um, go behind scenes one of the days that they were filming their documentary. It's called Weed the People, and um, <laughs> it's it hasn't come out yet. It's it's on its way out. But um, basically they are documentary, uh, documenting how CBD and THC works with um, terminally ill children. So, you know, there are so many parents out there who want to save their children and the, the current medical model isn't working and they are doing anything they can to get their hands on CBD or THC when it might be even illegal for them if they're in a state that doesn't already have laws protecting them for this. And um, Ricky and Abby are documenting, you know, their experience and what is happening to these children who get this medicine. So um, they took me behind the scenes one day and my mind was blown when I was listening to the doctors being interviewed and the patients who were being interviewed and what their stories were. And I started to think, well, how, what kind of effect, a lot of this is around cancer, you know, um, children with terminally ill cancers. And so I thought, well, what would the effect be on people with autoimmune disease or thyroid imbalance? And this is the effect of, just to make sure people listening mm -hmm. got it, CBD is uh, basically an oil extracted from marijuana. Uh, from cannabis specifically. Can so, fa fair point. But yeah, just for yeah. everyone listening who doesn't know the difference between cannabis and marijuana and everything else. So, so right. if, if you're just tuning into Bulletproof Radio, like we're talking about something that comes from what is considered an illegal drug in at least some backwater parts of the U.S. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> which is a lot of the U.S. sometimes. You know, it's just there are certain states that are just not passing this to make it available to people who really need this help. But um, so it's, it's a combination of CBD and THC that usually works, and and we can get into that. But. Basically, um, I started to think about, well, how would this work on autoimmunity and thyroid disease and realized there hadn't really been any research done around it. So I talked to Ricky and Abby and said, who would I reach out to if I wanted to create a study? I have all these patients here who um, 
who work with these doctors who, and they're not getting um, the relief they need. They're at least the symptom relief for sure, and the and the root cause. Forget about it. Like they they haven't even gotten there yet. So how could we help people alleviate some symptoms, and could we reverse the autoimmune response? This is what I wanted to know. So Ricky and Abby put me in touch with the woman they're featuring in the documentary, Mara um, Mara Gordon, who is. Um, providing, she's basically a compound pharmacist, and she is providing these high levels of CBD slash THC ratio, almost like syrups, to these terminally ill children. And so they put me in touch with her, and now we are um, working with some doctors and creating a study right now to um, see what can we do to affect the symptoms of people with thyroid imbalance, and can we shut off the autoimmune response? So we'll see. Um, it's uh, it's interesting uh, the the number of ways you can potentially affect autoimmunity. I, I've tried some very high end CBD oils. Uh, they're commonly used in the autism community, and one of the things that I, I do is I, I do work to help autistic kids and, and to help uh, help prevent autism from even happening in the first place by knowing more about autoimmunity. And this is an area of interest for me for a very long time, and. So I, I've had a chance to try some of these things, various extracts. Some of them are really expensive, some aren't. And in my own case, there's a moderate reduction in autoimmune symptoms, but not not major ones. But it's so individual. It's also probably a question of how was the CBD oil made. But it, it seems like we're just figuring out there's a lot of stuff that can happen. But is it a requirement that it have THC in it? Because so many people are, oh, well, THC, like that's that's the bad part. I don't know what any chemical can be good or bad, but um, you know, that that's somehow worse than the CBD part. Um, do you have to have that? Well, um, I, actually, Mara and I were just talking about this the other day, and it really is up to the individual's makeup. You know, we each respond to any medicine or supplement or food even completely differently. So some people may derive total benefit from CBD only. Some will require a CBD THC combination. Some people, um, and I know this is used a lot of times with adrenal fatigue, uh, just THC only can work. But what people also need to understand is our body naturally creates THC. We have something in our body called the endocannabinoid system. And it's actually the system kind of residing behind even the thyroid gland and the endocrine system. You know, the thyroid gland is really considered your control center, but behind that is actually the endocannabinoid system. And um, that, is, that system is what is always trying to get us back to homeostasis. And so what it does sometimes is create our own natural occurring THC. So when people think about CBD or THC, one thing that they should think about is that it's really just supplementing, just like you would take extra vitamin D if your vitamin D levels are low, or extra vitamin C if you need more vitamin C. When people are using CBD oil or THC oil or a combination of both, it's really just supplementing what is going on in the body to help boost it so that you can get back to that homeostasis. So it, it all depends on, on the dose and you know, the usage. You might use it for autoimmunity. You also might have it at a party and just take more of it. But it, it, it's the same with another hormone that you can take, oxytocin. Right? Your body right. makes oxytocin. I've actually had a prescription for oxytocin, not oxycontin, which is right. synthetic, <laughs> very right. different drugs. <laughs> but you can take sublingual or even injectable oxytocin if your levels are low. And you, you can, for some people, it affects autoimmunity as well, just to bring their oxytocin back up. And you know, maybe it's low even if you're having sex five times a day, which generally also raises oxytocin. Uh, so it, it, it's just so individualized. But when you have the data and then you're like, well, my body's low in this thing, um, I, I'm amused at the idea of bioidentical THC um, <laughs> be, because that would just cause huge problems in all sorts of marketing. But um, right. uh, the, the whole point here is that just because something is quote, good or bad, it's probably also a question of level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing goes for copper. Too much copper, you die. <laughs> not right. enough copper, you die. And the same is true for cortisol. It's not the death hormone. It's that you don't have enough cortisol, your life sucks. You have too much cortisol, your life sucks. So keeping things in levels and using natural compounds or heck, using chemical things like drugs or electricity or lasers, I don't care, but it's my right to keep my own neurochemistry where I want it to be for me to feel and act and be the person who I want to be. And, and it, I get irritated when anyone says, you can't have access to whatever that is. I'm like, 
Really? <laughs> like, that's not okay. Well, that's the problem that they're really following in the documentary is these um, parents are committing felonies. I mean, it's technically a felony to get this medication, right? Because either they're having to get it across state lines or however. So um, they're really following the problems that these parents face when there is this viable, you know, healing method, even cure in some of the, the children's cases that is there and is re and could be readily available, but different laws are keeping people from healing. So that really stinks. And then something else you mentioned that I wanted to bring up is that I think some people, you know, THC gets such a bad name, but it's, it's when you heat it up that it has the psychoactive properties. So a lot of times in the oils, it's not heated to a point that it's going to release what creates the psychoactive nature in your brain. It's just, you know, when I've taken THC oil, it's two drops on my tongue and all it does is it relaxes my nervous system so I'm not in fight or flight all the time. And when you're dealing with an autoimmune disease, especially Hashimoto's, and you're going back and forth between hypo and hyper thyroidism, you know, oftentimes you can be super anxious. Two drops of that, I can focus on everything on my body is relaxed i'm not like i'm not high i'm not out there i'm not incapable of operating heavy ma uh, machinery which i don't generally but <laughs> you know the point is um people should know that there is a difference in what is you know just smoked marijuana and then what are the therapeutic cbd and thc oils it, it's sort of like the old debate of you know, hemp versus pot where right. it, there's industrially useful things you can do with hemp and it's probably better than cotton for the environment. In fact, I would go beyond probably, um, but like we can't do that even though we printed the constitution on it. And, <laughs> and so we, we just oversimplify in our zeal for marketing and we mm -hmm. get to the point where, well, you know, THC must be bad. And what you're saying is, well, the temperature of the THC matters. And it, it absolutely does. And funny, it's the same thing with egg yolks. <laughs> <laughs> like raw egg yolk <laughs> has a very different effect than one that you've like seared because a seared egg yolk has oxidized cholesterol. Like they're just different things. Right. And right. the fact that they came from the same thing at the beginning, you know, it, it, it just requires a, a nuanced approach and usually using the legal system for nuances that hasn't worked out well historically. Right. It's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see the CBD therapeutic side of things? Uh, do you see that that becoming more widely available in the U.S. or is this only like Washington and uh, and Colorado at this point? No, I th I mean I think the tide is turning. I think we're hitting the tipping point for sure. It's hard um, because I live in California. I I see it from this really progressive angle, and so um, I don't always know what's going on outside of California. But um, I do know because Mara and I talked about it last week it was that it, it, we're at the tipping point and it looks like a lot um the research is coming out that just the research is supporting this as a viable healing modality for people especially those with terminal um illness especially those with um alzheimer's um with autism with um oh, when you have those parkinson's tremors, parkinson's and there's another one ALS? I, I'm assuming that would work for that, but I don't know. Okay. But it, no, it's when you have the convulsions. There's a word Epilepsy. for that. Yes, thank you. Epilepsy, and that is for sure. So um, as the research is supporting this, and, you know, the government itself has a patent on CBD oil use for certain um, medical conditions. The government has a patent on it. Wow. So um, as the research... Uh, proves more, we're going to see the states and the laws moving more in couldn't, that direction to allowing people to have that medication. Couldn't the government sell that patent to China like they did most of the country's freeway system? I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, it could. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, government. Uh, but in all seriousness, if you patented it, you might know that there's some application there and little old people right. like me would like to use it and probably like several million others. So it's, it's one of those things where the internet and the cloud and social media and all has, has changed people's awareness of things like this. So it's harder to just sort of keep them underground. And also the people I know who work in government actually want to help people. They're not like dark, evil goblins. 
Uh, although there might be a few of those in some corners, who knows? <laughs> but but for the most part, like okay, so the intent to help was we'll make we'll keep this way because it, it's bad. But then we realized, well, maybe it's not so bad. It's nuanced, so then people want to do it. I'm encouraged to see that the feedback cycle is getting faster and faster. Like it might only take 10 years, whereas if you fast, if you go back so long, it might have taken a whole generation. Like all the people who believe that old stuff have to die before you're allowed to do it. And now the people who believe it are looking at polls and data, and they're like, "My God! Like everyone in the country wants something, uh, even if they don't want it for themselves, they want it for someone they know." So like we're just gonna chill because we want to get reelected. So good things are happening, and they're happening faster, and, and that, that's cool. Yeah, and, and people are starting to speak up because I, I wrote just a very simple article on it on CBD oil for thyroid, you know, for thyroid conditions. And I was inundated with people saying, I've tried everything else. I really want to try this. Can I be a part of the study? Or, you know, or that they're already using it and it's helping them with their insomnia or this or this. But if they start speaking to their, you know, their local legislature, legislature they, you know, they can really um, affect change. And I'm hoping that this is what this documentary will do too. It just bring awareness and have people rise up and say, look, we want this. This is a, a real healing modality. So, so what does it do specifically for thyroid? I mean, there's generalized autoimmunity and Hashimoto's is one type of autoimmunity, but you know, there's osteo or there's rheumatoid arthritis. There's, right. there's many other kinds. Is CBD oil like a general autoimmunity suppressant that people with any kind of autoimmunity could consider? Or is there a specific thyroid story here that I don't know about? No, well, I mean, CBD in particular is amazing for inflammation. So it will... Um, decrease that inflammation and it will give your body the opportunity to heal itself. So it's always kind of like the precursor thing. It's not actually like the thing that is doing it. It is allowing your body to repair. So, so, but in cancer, it's different. Actually, cancer CBD oil will go in there. It can actually enter those, um, those cancer cells where other things can't and kind of kill it from the inside out. Interesting. That sounds, uh, that sounds cool. And anytime you mention, you know, cancer, immediately the 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 drug companies get really interested in that because it's such a big problem here so are there uh, are there attempts that you know of to take a natural compound like cbd and turn it into a, a patentable drug so you can charge like a thousand dollars a gram for it well this was um a recent discussion i heard a panel speak on this and so there's there's both the fear and the hope that these drug companies will take this over right so the fear is the drug companies will take it over. It might not have the same high level quality. It will become expensive. The hope is if the drug companies do start doing this, then, you know, the, then people can start getting healing that way. So I have, I don't know of any specific companies doing it, but what the panel was saying is that they are researching it. You know, tests are being done. Things are being created. Well, let's, uh, let's hope that they don't do one of those kind of nasty things like they did with GHB, uh, which mm -hmm. is one of the most potent sleep drugs known to man, but it's a natural compound. So there was a carefully orchestrated smear campaign to take GHB off the market, uh, which resulted in great sales for drugs like Ambien that are much more harmful to the body and don't cause a release of growth hormone. And then magically now you can buy GHB with a very careful prescription and it's terribly expensive. And now right. a natural compound is sold as a drug. That's kind of the business model these guys have. I don't want to see that happen with CBD. So if no. it comes from a plant, something that's in our food already, or it's already in the body, like drug companies, hands off, figure out how it works, make some artificial <laughs> drugs. Like maybe I'll buy them from you if they really work or something, but don't mess with my biochemistry. It's mine. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, have you, did you see the sacred science? I just watched that documentary and I, the statistic that popped out was something like 40% of um, what goes into these pharmaceuticals are, you know, derivative uh, derivatives of plants from the Amazon. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of natural medicine that goes into these things. And, um, and so I'm, they're always looking. Yeah. I'm, I'm not opposed to drugs. So a lot of people are like, oh, I only take natural compounds. I'm like, no, I take what works best. It has the best safety profile, the best risk benefit. And I'm very agnostic about that. Um, it's just that quite often going at it from a systems perspective and a natural perspective, especially for autoimmunity, is better than mm -hmm. taking like immunosuppressive drugs, which you can take that are quite expensive, but then you have a higher risk of cancer and other things. Right. And it is complex, but... How did your how did your Hashimoto's end up? Is is it still there? Are you still actively managing it? Like like how effective have all of your interventions been? 
It's been really effective. It goes, I do still manage it. So when I don't treat my body well, if I start eating poorly or if I have high levels of stress and I'm not managing them well, I'll see the antibodies kick back in. Um, and then I can reverse them fairly quickly, you know, following the protocol that I found for myself that works. So it's just a matter of me managing it. But that's why I'm really looking for something that will turn it off. And, and I'm hoping that there's some there's something to the CBD or the THC or something else out there. I, I'm just always experimenting and always on the lookout and following the breadcrumbs and trying to figure out how can we turn off the autoimmune response so but for the most part um, I live symptom free I uh, I only really notice it in the blood work if I've been really stressed it'll be like oh there are some antibodies great now I know but then it's also my wake-up call to say start taking care of yourself you know stop overworking and start relaxing and, and, and carve out time so anytime I see that my blood work is out of whack I post that up and tell everybody, oh, I got to take care of myself. And so I do it. <laughs> well, that's helpful to have a little bit of community involvement. Um, I've noticed from my own Hashimoto's, clearly there are food triggers, gluten being the worst, whole grains, mm -hmm. but also uh, mold toxins, like environmental mold toxins are, are shown in like dozens and dozens of studies to trigger different kinds of autoimmunity, uh, specifically to the thyroid, specifically to the adrenal uh, med medulla and to the pituitary gland, which controls the thyroid gland. Just all of these different things can be turned on. And so like something in the environment or in your food throws a switch and then your immune system's like, oh look, I'll attack that. And there's herbal ways to suppress uh, the autoimmune response. There's relaxation things like heart rate variability training, like the energy medicine that you've done, like reducing stress from cranial sacral things, getting more sleep. And so what you've found is you found that you manage your stress levels and if the stress gets out of hand, your immune system starts to attack itself. The stress goes down, mm -hmm. the immune system goes down, right? Yeah, that, absolutely. That's awesome. And this is why managing your stress, including things like exercise, what, do you, what would happen if you, you know, ran 10 miles a day every day for a month? Oh, for me personally, my I, my immune system would start attacking me. Exactly, <laughs> because your stress would be it'd be too much stress, right? So overtraining yeah. is a stressor, right? And, Absolutely. And do you know how many people in the U.S. have autoimmune conditions? It's something like sixty million. 55, I, I, there's a variety of statistics yeah. out there, but I've seen between 50 and 80 million for autoimmune diseases and something like 300 million worldwide, something huge. Yeah, I suspect it's more than 300 worldwide, but it depends because the, the rates are different and the diagnosis is different in different countries, but it's like a lot, like tens of millions of people and more people are at risk of it and the rate of them is increasing because of the things we're doing to our environment, to our soil and the chemicals we use. And, and, yeah. and things like that. So that's why if you're listening to this and you're saying, well, that was interesting, but you know, I don't use CBD oil and my immune system is great. Well, do the things that keep it great because you don't want to walk into a buzzsaw. And if you've not had autoimmunity and then you get in a car accident and your stress levels go up in the middle of a divorce, <laughs> when you have the flu and maybe that's what triggers it. And then all of a sudden you're on this, you know, something's wrong and nobody knows what, and you've seen 10 doctors and all of them said something different. And mostly they said you were crazy and here have some Prozac. Like mm -hmm. I, there's millions of people who've had this sort of thing happen. And autoimmunity is oftentimes one of the things there and what triggered it. It may be different for you and maybe different for someone else. But if you don't understand that cycle, you don't know to look out for it. And when it, it may happen to you, when it does happen to you, you want to just understand it because then it's easy to fix if you catch it early. But if you just like grind your health down because nobody knew, then it, it's just a, it's a bigger challenge. So that's why this podcast is here. That's why I wanted to have you on just to talk about like, what does this do to you? Yeah, and you know, and misdiagnosis I think is the bigger problem. And you're right that it's probably a way higher number of of people with autoimmunity because it is often misdiagnosed, undiagnosed. I know I went through thirteen thirteen doctors, two ER visits, and was never diagnosed, even though I was told over and over again I was getting full blood blood panels and everything. And and people really do need to look at your food source, your environment. I lived next to LAX for 15 years. That could definitely have contributed at that, all that jet fuel I was breathing in and out and being so close to the ocean, there was a lot of um, mold in the, yeah. in the air. So you have your molds, you have your environmental toxins, and then our our culture, it's just a high stress culture based on, you know, overwork and overwhelm and 
that's in, and even over fitness, you know, just like you were saying with the exercise, we overdo it a lot in our culture and that can be a trigger too. So like, I, I loved what you said, because if, if you don't have, if your immune system isn't off now, protect it, <laughs> protect it. Cause there are so many things actually assaulting it that could trigger, trigger autoimmunity. Very well said. And that's a, an amazing piece of advice. And that leads into our final question when I've asked everyone on the show. And it's, uh, what are your top three recommendations for people who, who just want to perform better? And not just as athletes or something, but just given everything you know in your life, not just about thyroid and autoimmunity and PTSD, but the three mm -hmm. most important pieces of advice. Well, here's what I do. <laughs> I would say I love energy. Oh, energy work, energy medicine, energy healing, whether that comes from working with a cranial sacral person. And oftentimes they are DOs. So, you know, they have a medical background and they have extra education. So something like cranial sacral therapy, Reiki, acupuncture, um, there are all types of healers out there that there isn't really a term for, but you'll, you'll know them when you find them. Um, so definitely that. I just think that that can do a world of good that a lot of people haven't tried yet and aren't and haven't experienced. Um, coffee enemas. I love your them. your top three things? <laughs> Maybe it's not for everybody, but um, I just, it's so great for uh, when it's done carefully. And, you know, I, I've done it under my, my doctor's supervision. You know, he told me how many times he wanted to see me try this. And, you know, so it's not like, oh, I just started doing coffee enemas and I was doing them every day. So you want to talk to um, a professional about can, that. Can, but, I, can I share one yeah. quick tip for, for everyone uh -huh. about coffee enemas? Here's the most important thing. You cool the coffee off first. Okay. That's oh, all. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no super hot coffee. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I have really found with myself and my clients, and maybe it's because I'm so embedded in this thyroid and autoimmune world, and that is my world right now, is that it just seems to help everybody just process things better, feel better, and, and done regularly and carefully is just a great part of you know any sort of health protocol. And, and done in the morning or you won't sleep all night? Is... Um, you know, for me, and I'm really sensitive to caffeine, um, I've done it in the afternoon. It, it actually absorbs in your body completely differently, yeah. which is, it was one of the reasons why I didn't want to try it for so long. There were so many years that I had heard from many people who had reversed their autoimmunity that the coffee enema was the thing that actually stopped the autoimmune response for them. And I refused to do it because I was so sensitive to caffeine and my adrenals were all messed up. And then finally, my doctor said, you've got to try it. You really do. And I found that I don't have any jitter and it doesn't keep me up. Um, I've never tried it past 4 p.m., so I, I can't say. But, you know, morning is probably best. That's when I usually it, do that. It's pretty ampy, at least for me. I, I'm like, there I admit it, I've done coffee and I'm a, how I not? I'm a coffee <laughs> guy. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I get pretty stimulated, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, and I think, um, are you, were you using roasted coffee? Because uh, the, the key is that it, they ha it has to be unroasted. You use green coffee? I don't know. No. Okay, so I'm talking to you, the coffee expert, but I you can't don't even grind know green, green coffee. Like it, grinders don't. It's a golden coffee. It's yeah, not use a, use a light roast. You get less chlorogenic yeah. acid that way. But interesting. Yeah, that's. The, I mean, it, it's roasted been, though, because green coffee. It's like, roasted. Okay, yeah. but it's like a light toast versus a full, like an yeah. Italian roast. It, it's interesting because <laughs> you get less of the main compound that causes glutathione in the liver when it's light roasted like that. Like there's a, a response curve with the roast cycle and not to, you know, get into a debate about the best coffee for that. But um, mm -hmm. you're the first person I've heard say that. So interesting. This is um, what I've learned just from kind of following the Gerson method um, in oh, terms this, of the this coffee. This comes from Gerson. Okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, the, at least coffee enema method I have been following. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And then um, this is a little bit more abstract, but I would say to take life from more of the feminine approach. So my third thing is really, um, our society is all about pushing through, not dealing with your emotions, not taking time off for yourself, and not caring for yourself. You've, you've got to accomplish a million things. You've got to be the best at everything. Um, my, my approach is to take a breath, take a beat, use your gentle power and your, you know, a lovable strength to 
to address everything in your world. Make sure you nourish yourself. And I think that is, you know, not to be stereotypical, it can be a real feminine quality to be nurturing. You need to turn that on yourself. So that would be my, my third thing. Um, awesome. That's why I wore like my pa my paisley shirt. If you're watching yes, a video, you can see like I, I'm getting in touch with my feminine side. I, I predicted you were going to say that, so I just you know, dressed the part. Right. <laughs> well, Jen Whitman, thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio today. Uh, would you tell people where they can find you? Give us your URLs, social media handles, and all that kind of stuff. Sure. You can find me at thyroidlovingcare.com and thehealthyplate.org. And right now we have an event going on and actually we'll be going on in per perpetuity, yourbestthyroidlife.com. And I'm at Thyroid Love and at Th Thyroid Love everywhere else. <laughs> so that's how you can find me. Well, thanks. Thanks again for being on the show and have an awesome day. Yeah, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Now, if you're watching on YouTube or on iTunes video, or you're just listening in your car and you got something of value from this episode, I would love it if you would think about picking up a copy of the Bulletproof Diet book, because when people buy them now, it really helps other people find them because we're still working on the New York Times list. And, and it's an amazing effort to try and show millions of people, hey, if you take control of how you eat and how you feel, then you can tune your food for your own personal biochemistry and you're going to feel different. And when you feel different, the first thing that happens is your brain turns back on. So if you would do me the favor, if this was helpful for you, pick up a copy of the Bulletproof Diet wherever you like to buy books. And if you don't do that, head on over to Facebook and click like or go to iTunes and just say, hey, this was useful. That's all I'm asking. You don't have to buy my coffee. If you do that too, hey, I love you. <laughs> it works. <laughs> that said, have an awesome day and enjoy the rest of your drive home. <laughs>